Hello, everybody. I'm Levi Litvoy, and I am very fortunate to talk to Alex uh, Wutke. Am I saying that right, Alex Wutke? Yes. Okay. Um, from the University of Mannheim, and we're going to talk about his article in the American Political Science Review. Congratulations for getting that out. It was published in 2020. Uh, uh, that's titled, When the Whole is Greater Than the Sum of Its Parts, on the Conceptualization and Measurement of Populist Attitudes and Other Multidimensional Constructs. And you have two co-authors, uh, Christian uh, Schimpf and uh, Harold Schoen. Uh, Christian Schimpf, I know, is at Mannheim. He might be a year or two ahead of you. Recent PhD now at the University of Alberta, I believe. And I don't know, Harold, can you maybe introduce him? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, he's my supervisor uh, and also doing political psychology. And he has the chair for political psychology here at the University of Mannheim. Oh, great, great. Okay, so I, I, I know that I, I remember that chair opening <laughs> at some point. So, mm -hmm. so he's the person who took it. Oh, great. Um, all right. So I look, this is one of my favorite articles ever. So I'm gonna be gushing about it. So this is for everybody to know that that I am. I'm kind of a measurement geek. And, uh, and to see an article of this quality uh, in the American Political Science Review is awesome. So I'm very much thank you for, for, uh, for uh, talking to us about this right now. So, all right. So this paper is about what you call non-compensatory -compens uh, concepts. Tell us what that is. <laughs> um. It refers to multidimensional concepts. So when you think of, for instance, democracy, you can ask yourself, is Hungary, for example, a democratic country or is it no longer a democratic country? And then you might say my conceptualization of democracy is in order to qualify as a democracy, you uh, need to have rule of law and you need to have free and fair elections. And then what a non-compensatory concept says it is not only it is not enough to only have free and fair election, but you also must have rule, rule of law. And what it also says is when even when you have a super high quality rule of law in your country, you cannot substitute very low levels of free and fair elections. So to put it differently, in a country where you do have frequent elections that are run very fairly, but you have no rule of law, um, then this country would still not qualify as a democracy because each of these subcomponents of the concept democracy constitute a necessary condition for the concept. And this is what we call, um, or others also have called non-compensatory concepts. And what we try to do is to bring this into public opinion research, because in public opinion research, we also have these kinds of concepts. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And uh, I'm not sure we know how to deal with them. <laughs> so this is why, why uh, yeah, I mean, this is why I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this piece. So, so the case study here is populism. Now, I don't think anybody listening to this will will be a complete stranger to the concept of populism. But let, let's let 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 us sum this up. What what are the three, or or what are the components, or what are the dimensions of populism that would be relevant here? Well, I, in my understanding, there's not still entire agreement about what are the three components. No. But let us say everybody agrees. For instance, anti-elitism is one of these necessary components. You would never say somebody is a populist when uh, this person does not hold anti-elitist attitudes. So this constitutes kind of a necessary condition for qualifying as a populist. And then there are some other components, for instance, maybe to have a money cane outlook on life, or maybe to support popular sovereignty, or um, to conceive of the society as a, a homogeneous unity. And then the argument here, when it comes to non-compensatory concept, the argument here is that being an anti-elitist alone does not make you a populist or supporting 
um, direct democracy, for instance, also does not make you a populist, but only when these components come together, then this fusion of the different orientation that makes something that is greater than the sum of its parts that brings about a new quality. And that then is populism because these different components go together in a particular way that make up for a thin but very specific ideology that is different than just, let's say, anti-elitism on its own. Yeah, very much so. And I can confirm that theoretically this is this is the case, is, is there needs to be like a simultaneous presence of, of, of these components. And I don't think these are very well represented in our measures. Uh, be it on the elite level or be it on the uh, on the on the mass level on the public opinion level so okay so so people have proposed survey questions that you know ask these survey questions and you'll f you can figure out how popular somebody is uh, but what you're saying is maybe there's nothing wrong with the survey questions themselves but there's something wrong with how they are applied right so how are they applied and what's wrong with it yes, i think Sometimes, or in many cases in social science research and populism research, but also beyond, we need to create some kind of index, an index of how populist are you. Sometimes this index is only binary and sometimes this index is continuous, but you need to aggregate multiple indicators or multiple dimensions into one. And the way we always do it is using averages. You can have some kind of weighted averages with uh, structural equation modeling. This would be the fancy type, but basically it, it's some kind of averaging. And the thing with averaging is <clears throat> that um, you add different pieces together. And when you look at the formula of adding pieces together, you immediately can see that you can substitute some elements by other elements. So you can, when you um, take um, when you have low levels on one component, you can make it up with very high levels on a different component. But as we said before, this is exactly what you cannot do when it comes to democracy, for instance, as you cannot substitute low levels of rule of law with very high levels of, of fair elections. So you, we need to come up with a system that avoids concepts measure inconsistencies because we want to have a measure that is just the way our concept is theorized. And so the way we would propose to operationalize populist attitudes, for instance, is to use a, a minimum, or you can also use different functions such as a multiplication. Um, but when you use a minimum, for instance, then you are as populist as you are on the lowest um, of the subcomponents. Um, so when you are not anti elitist at all, then you are just no um, populist, regardless of whether you strongly support uh, direct democracy, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so you propose three kinds of approaches that can be used for measurement. And uh, and very creatively, they're, they're named by very, very important scholars. Uh, the Bolin approach, uh, which is uh, Ken Bolin, who is kind of the uh, they would say that one of the grandfathers of uh, structural equation modeling, um, and he would be the the average, some kind of weighted average uh, um, person representing that that logic of psychometrics and and weighted average. And there's um, uh, Sartori, and there's uh, Gertz, and there's a footnote with some other approaches that can be used. So can can you uh, can can you now let's talk about how, what did you do to the scales to fit them in under these uh, these uh, these these uh, um, big name white uh, male scholars? <laughs> yeah, I think the only reason why we at the end dared to use their names is because we would say all these approaches are val valuable. Um, even though we do not recommend the Bolin approach for populism, for instance, it's not because it's inherently wrong, but it's just not right for this very concept. So the, the, the I, I am I am sure Cam Bolin is, by the way, is uh, rolling around in his grave despite not being dead. Um, based on how you use the scales, because because uh, what you propose is is let's just take an average. 
uh, of scores. And, you know, as the person who who is like the father of structural equation modeling, he would definitely want at least a weighted average, right? Uh, yes, even though we would, uh, we would think a weighted average is just a special form of an average. Um, yeah. But as, yes, I would, uh, we, <laughs> I actually, well, let's let's mm -hmm. let's skip to this part about whether or talk about it later whether uh, it was a good decision to name it after the scholars i'm also not so sure um <laughs> but so what what are the differences between these approaches so um yeah. when you have uh, some kind of um let's say conspiracy conspiracy theories and uh, conspiracy theories you might measure by agreement to different kinds of um, agreement with specific conspiracy theories and your agreement with these conspiracy theories then make up your predispositions towards conspirational ideas. Um, this is one way to measure it. And then you might say, well, these different indicators all tap into something. Um, one indicator might be better suited than the other for some persons, but some for the others all have measurement errors. These cancel each other out. And that would be a good way to use this Bolin approach using weighted averages, structural equation modeling, or a simple average across all these indicators, because then in the end, you will get so altogether, this person agrees strongly and is generally inclined towards um, conspirational thinking or not. Um, this would be the right approach um, when you do not have a concept where you would argue each component is a necessary condition for um, the target concept. But where you do have such a concept, such as in the case of democracy, um, there you would need a different approach. And then it depends on whether you say, well, democracy is a binary concept or it is a continuous concept. Um, yeah maybe you can conceive of democracy as both. And depending on the research question, you wanna uh, use it sometimes as binary and sometimes as continuous. And um, when you conceive of it as binary, what you can then could do is to um, use thresholds. Um, this would then be the Satori approach that you would say, well, on a scale from zero to one, you have to be above 0.7 in both rule of law and free and fair elections, and then a country is democratic. Um, and if you want to have a continuous outcome measure, then you would uh, use what we then labeled the Gertz approach, uh, which would, for instance, be the minimum across all subcomponents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what'd you find? <laughs> So you, tried find, many ways, you tried many ways of, of dealing with these scales, <laughs> these populism yeah, scales. What did you find? We, uh, we find that not always, but in some cases, right? um, it makes a difference which approach you uh, take. And we argue theoretically that in this case, the Bonn approach is not appropriate. Um, th this was not an empirical, but a theoretical and conceptual point. And then we said we, we investigated, so does it make a difference empirically which approach you take? Um, and we have a um, empirical impl application where we investigate the association between institutional trust and populist attitudes. And there, for instance, we see that we have a positive correlation between this inst institutional distrust and populist attitudes when you use the Bolin approach, but this seeming statistically significant correlation then fades away when you use it, uh, when you operationalize it using the Gertz approach. Um, so you have to be aware of which measure you use uh, when you use your, um, when you do your empirical analysis. Mm -hmm. And that is because populism is probably not related to political trust but an anti-establishment attitude is. But populism overall as a concept is not. Is that right? Yes, that, that would be our presumption um, because it makes sense that when you don't trust elites, then you do not trust um, those who are in political powers or those who 
um, occupy the positions of um, the political institutions. But maybe this ideology of conceiving of the world as being of uh, good and evil, direct democracy and anti-elitism, this ideology on its, uh, as a combination of different ideas, this uh, does not seem to be related with institutional trust. Um, and so you, you, you can get on the wrong track if you, if you use uh, the wrong measure. Mm -hmm. So at one point in this article, you do like a comparison of, of, of what's, the, what's the correlation if I operationalize this way as opposed to that way. And, uh, and the magnitude of those correlations are like 0 0.8, 7, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, et cetera. Some people would argue that, but that, that is still very high right yes yes so and I, does it matter or does it really make a difference if if the correlation is that high well what would be your response to this well i would agree that the correlation is high i think in some cases it's even uh, 0.9 and when you look at the charts uh, which classify the strength of correlation it would say well this is a strong correlation um but it's it's worth noting and it's interesting to note that when you compare the Bolin measure of populism with the Gertz measure of populism, you do it with the same data, with the same people, and you do not get the same result. You, did, you do get a strong correlation, but it's first to note, well, it's not the same. Um, and then it's we, ha we have a comparison in the paper um, to get an idea of what does it mean when you have a correlation of 0.8, because I, I don't, I cannot imagine what, what it means to have a correlation of 0.8. And this is basically the, um, similar to the correlation between your height and the length of your arms. So of course it's related that um, when you are a higher or taller person, and you have longer arms, but of course it's, it's not always the case. Some people are higher and still do not have that long arms and these kind of things. So that's not the same and it makes a difference. Um, and as we show, um, well, this difference also has implication for the empirical conclusions that you sometimes draw. We also actually do have this uh, application for conspirational thinking where we also see that in some cases it makes a difference whether you use the operationalization strategy that fits the concept or whether you use the operational uh, operationalization strategy that does not fit the concept but is just the one that we are very used to so i would agree yes the correlations are high and in many cases it it does not make a difference um, but if you know the the other way of doing it um, why don't you, why wouldn't you do it the correct way that uh, brings together the concept and the measure um, because it uh, lowers the probability of making a mistake? Yeah. So when I was reading this um, and thinking through the Gertz approach, uh, I, was, I was very much thinking that, well, the problem with this is that if you've got a scale and you talk about this, that, that the Manichaean worldview scales distribution is very different than the than the other two scales uh, distribution so if your scale if one of your sub is skewed left and the other is skewed right then the minimum will almost always be driven by the one that's uh, skewed right <laughs> so or wait no skewed yeah skewed right so um so why why wouldn't the the Gertz approach like like run into this problem of well you just it almost just by definition becomes the 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 distribution that is more skewed towards minimum values and and uh, not towards uh, maximum values and uh, and I I. I'm not phrasing this as a question because I know the answer. The answer is in the end of the conclusion, which says, oh yeah, you need to standardize these. <laughs> and that takes care of, 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 the, of, the, of the skewness problem at least a little bit. Because you know, the mean will be mean and, and it's standard deviation, at least to a large extent, it'll, it'll take care of the problem. 
I was just wondering why, 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 why did this only go into the like the conclusion? I, I figured it would be, it would, it would, it would have to be like early on in the paper, and it doesn't fully overcome the problem. I don't know. What do you think? I agree. Uh, I think there are many unresolved problems, and this is <laughs> one of the most central. So this is uh, something that we just observed. Hey, there is a problem here between the concept and the measurement, and we came up with this idea by reading other people's work and just applying other people's work to this case. Um, but I, I would also agree we have not fully solved this issue and I hope other people will. Um, and when it comes to this particular point of standardization, I, that's certainly not a solution because first standardization is a non-conceptual solution. I mean, that's a, a numerical empirical trick that you just uh, administer to your uh, indicators. But I think that the first uh, step that you always have to take when you try to deal with indicators and measurement is conceptual and theoretical. Uh, and it must always make you wonder when you have such a problem and cannot solve this conceptually. Um, and the conceptual point here would be, I think, that when we create future scales, we already, during scale formation, have to keep in mind that the scales must be comparable among the sub-dimensions of the concept. And this is something I think we have not done in the past. Uh, other people call this equating, um, I think. That's uh, the proper word. Uh, and equating is something that does not play a big role in scale formation. And so we did not want to step too deeply into this uh, river when we uh, wrote the article because we acknowledged this is a big problem. This uh, standardization is an initial problem that causes other problems because then you can no longer compare between countries, for instance. Um, but yes, uh, I acknowledge uh, this is something to keep in mind when you use the Gertz approach. Yeah. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a structural equation modeler and you know, I. Ken, Ken Bolin is one of, one of those idols um, I, I have. This is why I said I think he would be offended um, to, to, to use his name with an additive scale. Uh, but uh, so, okay, so one of the scales you use is, is, is a scale I developed with Bruno Castaño Silva, um, which is a populism scale. It has three dimensions. It, the three dimensions are people centrism, anti elitism, and Manichaean worldview. And, um, and this, I mean, this is one of the scales you, you apply this to. And, and this is very much a problem that we've been thinking about as well. That, that I think, I think in, 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 in the data that we, we tested this, even the correlation of even two of those components is like, like negative even. So, I mean, it, it, this is definitely not an additive scale. Like you're not, you're not supposed to be just adding them up and, and, uh, and using them accordingly. So there's, there's no theoretical reason. You cannot do a two level factor analysis on it. So this was clear from the get go. So, so we tried to come up with a solution of dealing with this, and of course, your solution would have been take the minimum of uh, of uh, of those factors. Uh, but I'm I'm very much a structural equation modeler, so I, I think differently. So what we came up with is, I think, hidden in one of your footnotes, footnote two, I believe, which is take take the three constructs, kind of normalize them between zero and one, so that we don't have to deal with negative numbers because those are complicated and and just take the product like multiply them together so it would be some kind of it would be close to what 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 the uh, geometric mean is which is what what was in that footnote is that that's another approach that you could use and uh, and and you know i think that takes care of it to some extent because if you're low on one value let's say zero and you're high on the other let's say one one let's take the exam extreme example you're still zero so, but but anything in between will will get you to uh, will get you closer. Um, so that's what we would have proposed. But 
I am not happy with this solution either. And I'm not happy with taking the minimum either. Um, I think using the factors instead of just an additive scale helps in, in what you what you mentioned that you want to normalize these things. You want to normal, you want to you want to normalize the three components. I mean, in confirmatory factor analysis, you you fix the latent variable to have a mean of zero and a and a standard deviation of one. So all three of them will have that. So that that, that actually takes care of, I think, one of your problems. Yes, there could be skewness that that it doesn't fully take care of that, but it takes care of that to some extent. So um, so so that is taken care of, but I'm not happy with the solution because I want to be able to model both the uncertainty that's associated with those items, which is what confirmatory factor analysis does, and be able to model the construct, uh, which is in this case, a non-compensatory construct. And you and I had conversations about this and I've had conversations with, with many, many, many people who have been teaching structural equation modeling at various prestigious method schools. And, and I think I even ran it up to, uh, to, to Ben Mutan once, who is the author of M plus. And, and I don't see a solution. I don't see a solution. There's, there's, uh, there's two citations in there, which you say there's some hope that IRT scholars will figure this out. Um, where are we at on this right now? Do you do you do you have a good so like a like a technically good solution that can take into all these things account? Yeah, I think that's the second big point that you raise, uh, which points to clear limitation of this approach, yeah. which is still unresolved. Um, and I myself and none of the co-authors are no statistician, and I think this is really where statisticians need to come in. Um, I think our main point was conceptualized, conceptual to point at this problem um, and propose an initial solution that uh, simple minded people can come up with, um, but that it will not make people happy uh, who are better at math. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it's uh, intractable. Um, we will have to see. So there are uh, IRT models that particularly try to um, take into account the, the idea of necessary conditions, um, which have been appearing over the past two or three years. But um, I have the feeling they are not yet widely acknowledged. At, and I um, myself cannot judge if they are the final solution. So I, I could only see that there is ongoing methodological progress on this front. Um, but I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not sure where, where this will finally end up. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe in, 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 in we're done with this kind of answers. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, since Fukuyama, Fukuyama published the, the end of history, I, I, I don't believe in these things. So, <laughs> so uh, I don't think we'll ever find it, but we should be looking for it. And, um, and again, the reason I really like this article is because conceptually, you point to a very, very important thing and how people should be thinking about um, their constructs. <laughs> and and uh, I like the case study, populism, it's close to my heart. And, uh, and so congratulations for getting this paper out. Is there anything we missed that we should talk about in this article? Um, no, I think we are, uh, we would be super happy if people just thought about this issue uh, when they do their own empirical analysis. And then they might judge themselves, do I have such a concept that is non-compensatory and that it has necessary conditions? And then think about um, whether the minimum or the multiplication that you talked about would be adequate um, or um, if uh, they would want to use some kind of an average, but just that we have this issue in our mind, I think that's already a step forward. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for talking to us about this. Thanks. Bye.